Are they brothers in crime? We begin with breaking news tonight. Two people arrested in connection to a murder case that happened back in January. They walked in front of our case had cameras a little earlier. Our Patty Santos staying on top of this story. Patty joined us live. Patty, what have we learned about this case so far? Yeah, we know that these two brothers are charged in connection to a capital murder crime that uh, investigators say happened exactly a month ago. Take a look. This is video. The latest arrest just hours ago by the Texas Rangers. Alfred Lopez was found in South Padre Island. He was flown back to the county tonight. Bear County investigators arrested his brother, Nicholas Lopez, on Friday. Investigators say the brothers lured the victims, Janelle Lopez and Xavier Alvarez, to a home on Calle Fincias, just outside 1604 and Highway 90. Investigators believe that the dispute there was happening over some sort of love triangle. Uh, now, uh, deputies tell us that the brothers had served time before and they're going to be facing this murder charge, which could possibly mean that they're going to be facing the death penalty if they are convicted. Steve. I'm good. Thank you so much. Like seriously, I am, I don't know how I could be more cooperative. A Hayes County elected official arrested for driving while intoxicated, doubled down on saying he's innocent even after striking a deal with prosecutors. Commissioner Walt Smith was ordered to serve nine months of community supervision and install an ignition interlock device. But he was in no mood to speak with case head investigates Dylan Collier after footage of his arrest in Austin was finally made public. April 28, 2021, just before 3.30 a.m., police respond to Lake Austin Boulevard and find a flipped over box truck that has dragged a pickup truck hundreds of feet after being struck in the intersection. Hey, this guy, uh, the gentleman in the jacket, strong odor of alcohol and beverage. The driver who ran the red light is none other than Hayes County Commissioner Walt Smith. Smith tells police he was at the state capitol two miles away for a late night hearing and had just two cocktails. But as Austin PD attempts to conduct a field sobriety test, Smith complains first of knee pain. Can you see the fight? And then that his eyes hurt from his truck's airbags deploying. Uh, so what, what, what's hurting you right now? Because you're fine right now. No, like my eyes are burning. Uh-huh. I'm just telling you, you're burning. After Smith. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Repeatedly stumbles in pain. The officer has seen enough. Well, you're placed under arrest for DWI. In an agreement with Travis County prosecutors last fall, Smith pleaded no contest to obstruction of a passageway, was given nine months of community supervision, and ordered to install an ignition interlock device on his vehicle for more than half of that time. After signing the deal, Smith released a statement claiming the matter concluded with, quote, my innocence confirmed. A bizarre conclusion that we felt demanded clarification. Commissioner Smith did not respond to our request for an interview, and his attorney sent us a statement that answered none of our questions. So we showed up to Smith's place of employment, the historic Hayes County Courthouse. Dylan with KSAT, hear about the video of your DWI arrest. Oh, I haven't seen it. No, you we've got court in two seconds. No, you got it in three minutes, so. Smith again said he was innocent and that if he wasn't, the prosecutor would have gone a different direction with his case. But again, I haven't seen the deal you know, for a first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you like to watch the footage we brought? No. If you would like to have a longer interview or something like that, uh, I would appreciate your reaching out just like you did last week. Smith added that even though officers seemed to doubt the extent of his injuries, the ailments were serious enough for him to later be treated at a hospital. There's no absolutely no reason for me to do that if it wasn't if there wasn't an injury there. For case that investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. The Commissioner Smith's community supervision runs until this summer. Records show he successfully paid off his more than $500 in fines and court costs in early November. Well, he's accused of killing a young boy's mother. It's a murder case nearly eight years in the making, and now U.S. Marshals have made an arrest on what would have been the victim's 31st birthday. 26-year-old Isaac Estrada facing charges in connection to the brutal stabbing of Courtney Phillips. Phillips found dead back in 2015 in her home on Edge Avenue near Pecan Valley Drive and I-37. Courtney was a single mother who was raising a young son. 
Tonight we spoke to a family friend who is now raising Courtney's son. They say they're relieved an arrest has been made. Uh, thanking God, first of all, for answering our prayers because it's definitely been a constant prayer for the, you know, the last eight years for justice. And then just a um, sense of gratitude for the task force that arrested him and just maybe a sense of peace that he's not out hurting anybody else. I think that the endless possibilities for her and what could have been for her had she um, not been murdered. What could have been? Bear County records show Estrada currently facing charges of murder, aggravated robbery, evading arrest. You can read more about the story right now on KSAT.com. All right, take a look at your screen. Police are asking for your help in finding this teenager. It is 19-year-old Christian Ray Belmudez. He's wanted in connection with the January 16th murder of Gabriel Sanchez and Sena McNeil. Officers say Belmudez is considered armed and dangerous. If you have any information that can lead to him, you're asked to call police or the U.S. Marshal's Office. That number's on your screen right now, 210-687-6996. Nearly a dozen people in jail, millions of dollars seized after a multi-agency drug bust in Kerr County. 11 people arrested in the operation. Four of them are from San Antonio. The Kerr County Sheriff's Office says they took in more than 27 kilos of cocaine, 56 kilos of methamphetamine, and nearly a pound of marijuana. Sheriff's deputies say the street value around $8 million, illegal guns, three fugitives, two undocumented immigrants, also found as part of this bust. They were on a trip to the beach with family. Now they're missing. A search underway for 13-year-old twin boys in Galveston. Last seen on a pier, that's according to the Galveston Beach Patrol, Jefferson and Josue Perez were reportedly missing, were reported missing rather, around 5.30 p.m. yesterday at Pleasure Pier in Galveston. Family members tell police no one saw them go underwater. The Coast Guard Beach Patrol and local first responders all involved in the search and a local nonprofit helping that family while that search continues. Censured but unbothered, Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez is shrugging off the Texas GOP's decision. Just two days after that vote in favor of a censure, Gonzalez and Eagle pass with other lawmakers today. That's where the night team's John Paul Barajas caught up with him. A formal vote of disapproval and cut off from Texas GOP resources. Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez doesn't seem phased and says, bring it on after being censured Saturday. At the end of the day, I will roll up my sleeves every single day and anybody who wishes to challenge me, it's a fool's errand. I'll run you to the deep end of the pool every single time and drown you. So I welcome it. The Texas Republican Party voted overwhelmingly 57 to 5 with one abstaining in favor of the censure. The party cited lack of loyalty to Republican principles and priorities. Look, in life, there's people that like you, there's people that don't like you. Uh, I served 20 years in the military. I learned a long time ago. You can't please everyone and nor should you try. You should be firm in who you are. You should fight for the things you believe in. Gonzalez has voted against the majority of the Republican Party in a handful of things like supporting gun control measures after Uvalde, in favor of same-sex marriage, being the only Republican to go against a House Republican rules package, and disagreeing with the fellow Texas Republican proposed border security measures, which is why he visited the Eagle Pass border today with other lawmakers from around the U.S. It's now time to stop the talk and we need action. Real tangible solutions for the people that are impacted by this. And it's not just those along the border. You'll hear from my, my, my colleagues. Every, every state has become a border state. On the list of penalties for that censure, Congressman Gonzalez won't be able to use any state GOP funds for his primary election campaign, and the Republican Party is encouraging him not to run as a Republican. Those penalties will expire on May 28th of next year, the date of the primary runoff. In Eagle Pass, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Now for a look at your night beat news flash. Disturbing details coming out about the four Americans who were kidnapped on a trip to Mexico. Mexico President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador said on Friday the group went to Matamoros to buy medicine. Some other news outlets reporting one of the four was there for plastic surgery and this may have been a case of mistaken identity. We don't know where the Americans are from, but we do know their van, which had North Carolina license plates reportedly caught in the crossfire of two different armed groups shortly after they entered Mexico. All four Americans kidnapped at gunpoint today. Obrador said he expects the situation to be resolved quickly. The FBI San Antonio Division Office is helping in this investigation. 
Also a $50,000 reward being offered for their safe return. Actions such as this will not be tolerated. When you attack law enforcement officers, when you damage equipment, you are breaking the law. And this was a very violent attack that occurred this evening. Very violent attack. It's under construction. It's a place that will be known as Cop City in Atlanta. And over the weekend, it's where a planned protest turned into a violent display against law enforcement. Video from yesterday's event shows people throwing rocks, setting fires at the police training facility. More than 20 people detained. They are now facing domestic terrorism charges. No police officers were hurt in this. However, construction vehicles were torched. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. They're being stolen at an alarming rate. Still ahead on the Nightbeat, we're going to show you how an important vehicle software update for Kias and Hyundais can help keep thieves from getting inside the vehicles. It's next on the Nightbeat. All right, I want to show you something. This sticker right here on a Kia could keep thieves away. It's the sticker that Ansira dealerships are placing on windows of Kia vehicles that have gone through the anti-theft software updates. The night team's Patty Santos tells us how in less than an hour, older model Kia owners could have more peace of mind. A stolen Kia found in this condition. And this is the same story being played out for Kia owners across the city. It's a TikTok trend going on right now. In the fall, we started reporting about the online challenge that sparked a rise in thefts of older model Kia and Hyundai cars, made easy to steal due to a faulty ignition switch. Now some good news. Update. So we're doing the update now? Kia and Hyundai software updates are now available for millions of vehicles. So ignition switch off for 10 seconds. Sean Madison, software tech at Ansira Kia, shows us how in less than 15 minutes he's able to update the vehicle software. So whenever you go to start the car, um, it reads the key now, and if it doesn't see a key in the vehicle, it won't start the vehicle. Just trying to get it out there. And VP General Manager of Ansira Kia, Brian Rodriguez, says the upgrades are available for Kia models older than 2022. This update is a dealer-only specific update has to be done with a Kia computer. Owners will start getting letters in the mail notifying them about the updates, but they can also just call local dealership to schedule one immediately. It has been successful. Updated. This sticker is placed on the side windows, a warning to thieves. Yeah, so it's to let the people know that it actually has a immobilizer system in it now. But Rodriguez reminds drivers no vehicle can be made theft proof. Whether it's a Kia, whether it's any other maker model, if they want to steal it, they're going to steal it. Yeah. You're not going to stop them. Patty Santos, Case Sat 12 News. It's trending right now on our website, dozens of pairs of designer shoes among the items that will be auctioned off later this week at SAPD's asset seizure auction. Air Jordans, Yeezy shoes, Lucchese boots are on that list of around 100 items that will be available at the auction. We have a full list along with where and when the auction's happening. It's right now on ksat.com, all that information. All right, let's go to Sky 12 now, flying over downtown, the Emily Morgan Hotel right next to the Alamo. Nice shot there from Sky 12 around the, one of the iconic buildings downtown. And it was, you know, it's still 72 degrees. You're telling me, Adam, in the next few days, that's going to be the high. Yeah, we're going to cool off a little bit. And okay. we'll have a little bit of a yo-yo action with our temperatures in the days ahead. And we'll get to that in a moment, but I do want to get you ready for tomorrow morning. Noticeable humidity out there. That's going to lead to another round of fog and drizzle. And we're going to see that for several more days until that Friday cold front hits, which does give us a storm chance as well. Let's talk about the cold front where it is right now, what it's going to be doing between now and then, because it will be bringing some rain to some folks. Notice our temperatures. 70s and 60s, low 60s in the hill country, Kerrville, Fredericksburg, 61, 72, San Antonio, still near 80 degrees as you get down into Laredo. You go farther to the north, Lubbock drops to 56, Amarillo 55, and then we got some 20s and 30s up the plains. That's this cold front here that's dropping southward now into north Texas. And this is going to just sit around really for a few days. It's moving in, it's going to stall out and really be the focal point of some showers and thunderstorms to the north of us in North Texas, Oklahoma, and even Arkansas for several more days. It's just going to camp out and kind of wiggle around a little bit for a few days until a new system develops, brings a cold front in that says, all right, let's get moving southward. 
they do. And then by Friday, we have that move through our neck of the woods, which gives us that slight chance of a few showers and thunderstorms. Looking at it this way, though, when you look at the overall moisture over the next seven days, snow shown in blue and white here on the screen, green, of course, the rainfall. And across the nation, there's going to be some activity over the next seven days and some hefty accumulations, especially in the mountains of California again when it comes to snow. But around here, it's really just North Texas and East Texas getting in on the action. We're still missing out. This just isn't our time right now. Hopefully that changes or we're going to be in a world of hurt as we get into summertime as we already are in an exceptional drought locally. 30% chance on Friday. That's the best we have right now. We can cross our fingers that we'll raise those chances. Unfortunately, I just don't think it's in the works with this uh, with this go around. Dew points in the 60s. You feel that humidity and mugginess in the air. It's going to lead to reduced visibility for the morning commute. Here's a look at our future cast and notice at times throughout the morning commute we will have some visibility is maybe one to two miles. It's going to change and kind of ebb and flow throughout the morning commute. But at any given time, you can expect fog to be on the roadways and just thicker in some locations opposed to others. And that'll fluctuate through the morning. But by 930, 10 a.m., it should lift. Visibility will improve and we'll start to get rid of that morning dampness. But just like what we had earlier today, we're going to have another round of it tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. Here's the case at 12 hour forecast 64 at 7 a.m. with that fog and drizzle by 11 o'clock, really just low clouds at 69 degrees. And then into the afternoon, we get some sunshine again in 83. And of course, these high temperatures are very sunshine dependent. Say, for example, the fog clears out a little earlier than expected. Well, then we'd probably be a little bit warmer. But bottom line, be in the 80s with some noticeable humidity. South side of town, Stinson about 85, New Braunfels 84. Castroville 86 and Hondo, a high of 85. Low to mid 80s, Wednesday as well, Thursday, but then we get into Friday, that cold front hits, and we'll drop down into the 70s for our high temperatures, probably closer to 72 with that 30% chance of storm. Saturday looking pretty good, still in the 70s at that point. Warm up briefly till another week cold front pays us a visit on Monday, and really just a mixture of 70s and 80s for the next seven days and spring like conditions. You see the blue bonnets popping around <laughs> and here's a good shot from the southwest side of town. Is that time of year? It is. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. Their colors are black and gold. Their theme for the state tournament Gold blooded. Gold blooded. Talking about Lytle. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when we're talking about Lytle, so the boys team that just advanced the state, yeah. they felt like they were the first team in Lytle's boys high school basketball history to advance the state. Well, actually, they're the second team following the 1924 squad that advanced. And the way they found out, it's a pretty cool story. And in women's college of basketball, Trinity is in the third round of the D3 tournament once again. Coming up. To be honest, I was a little upset because I wanted, you always want to be the first, right? It is what it is, but 100 years later, hey, we're just happy to get there. Being the second Lotta Boys basketball team to advance the state is still pretty darn cool in big board sports. The Lytle Pirates are having a wonderful season on the basketball court, and this week the boys are getting ready to face Childress in the UIL Class 3A state semifinals. After winning the regional final Saturday, it was believed that Lytle was advancing the state for the very first time. But hold on. Back in 1924, the Lytle boys basketball team earned a trip to state, and here's the picture to prove it. On the left, it reads 1924 basketball team went to state with the names of the players next to a picture of them in their jerseys. At the bottom right, it reads at the train station waiting to go to state along with another pic of the guys wearing suit and ties. So after sending in the required playoff paperwork, it was the UIL that told Lytle about that 1924 squad. On Saturday, you know, after we won the game, we thought we were the first team in Lytle history, basketball-wise, uh, to make the state tournament. And then all of a sudden on Sunday, we get an email uh, saying that we're the second Lytle team. So then myself and my athletic director, Lori Wilson, we start trying to research. So we call our mayor, Mary Gonzalez. He goes back, I guess, to our library 
finds some archives and then he finds out that there was an actual 1924 team that had made it to the state tournament. Um, the only difference was they had to get on the train to get to wherever the tournament was at. So that was a pretty cool uh, story and research that our mayor did on Sunday. So that was exciting. And for the kids, sending them the picture of what they look like to how we look now, it was just, it's a total amazement. That is an awesome story. Lida will play Childress Wednesday, 3 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. Turning to women's college basketball, the Trinity Tigers are getting ready for the third round of the NCAA Division III playoffs. The Tigers hosted and won the San Antonio Regional last weekend, beating UT Dallas 79-62 and then defeating Hardin-Simmons 88-69 in the second round. I don't think I've ever seen this gym as packed as it was last weekend, so having the student body come out and support us was awesome. And, you know, a little bittersweet the first game playing against our old coach, but we're all super proud of him. And, you know, beating a team three times like Harden Simmons, they're really good. We respect them a lot, so that was we knew that was going to be a challenge, and I think we came out prepared. I think that this whole season we've just remained focused, we've remained calm, we've um, learned with everything. We've learned with losses, learned with wins, we've learned with hard practices. Um, any type of problems we've or adversity we've, we've kind of dealt with and we've come together we've gotten really close over all of it. I think we're all just focused on the next game that's all we're thinking about we have toughs next we feel confident we just got to work on ourselves I think every game so far this season we've just been focused on ourselves and that's what we'll do for the next one. Trinity will head to Medford Massachusetts to face Tufts University in round three Friday 6 30 p.m. local time on the Jumbo's home floor. Winners of a season high four in a row, the UTSA Roadrunners feel like they're peaking at just the right time heading into the Conference USA Championships this week. The ladies started off the season slowly, but finally caught fire at the end, winning six of their last eight games. Junior Jordan Jenkins, who transferred here from USC, has been a big part of the turnaround, and the Roadrunners community has taken notice. There's been like more people coming to our games, and we see new faces every, well, we saw new faces every home game. So, I mean, yeah, I think I'm glad that I chose to do something different, and I think that, yeah, it'll show a lot of people that as long you just, at the end of the day, you're just playing basketball, you know? So, you can go wherever, you just have to be great. Six seater Roadrunners open with number 11 Florida Atlantic Wednesday, 2 p.m. at the Star in Frisco. The Dallas Cowboys told the player, tag, you're it after the break. As expected, the Dallas Cowboys have placed a franchise tag on running back Tony Pollard. They're doing so because both sides haven't been able to agree to a long-term deal, and they don't want to lose their 25-year-old back to free agency. If Pollard plays on the one-year tag, he'll make $10.1 million next season. His rookie contract paid him nearly $3.2 million for four years. UTSA football kicked off spring camp today, and they did so 14 years to the day that Larry Coker was introduced as the first head football coach in program history. I mean, that's pretty cool. Current head coach Jeff Trailer has an influx of new players and needs a little help while learning all the new guys. That's one of the reasons I have that clipboard out there. If you always go to my very back page, uh, I have the roster of every player and every name just to get, you know, brushed up every day. So, yeah, that's always. And then we take all of our single digit guys off. So that's the first time I've seen them in their old high school numbers or whatever it might be again. So, yeah, today's always. Uh, no matter how much you prepare and how many years you do this, there's always still that first time. This was the first of 15 spring practices for Coach and his guys. And I saw the Coach trailer tweeted out his appreciation for Coach Coker, Larry Coker, and yep. what he did when he set up that program 14 years ago. So he did. It was a class move. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. All right, this is not your typical roadkill. Check this out. It is a 14-foot long python, likely one somebody's pet, found on the side of the road in Long Island, New York. Officers removed the reptile, now trying to figure out where it came from. By the way, pythons are illegal to have as pets in New York unless owners have a dangerous animal license. They can actually get up to 20 feet long, too. Uh, long Island, how does that survive the winter? It, it had to be inside. Yeah, I see, I see. All right, so fog and drizzle in the morning tomorrow. We're going to have that every morning through Thursday. Spring-like all the way through Thursday as well. Can you imagine if you saw that in the road? <laughs> Run right over it, yeah, sorry. Exactly. <laughs> See you tomorrow.